Thanks. Well, I thought I'd start off by trying to define the terms because although we use these terms regression dilution and residual confounding, they're not universally used. Um, they both are concerned with the errors, the effect of noise in what you're using as an expansionary variable or what you're adjusting for as a confounder. And in fact, the formula are really, really rather similar for the two things. But regression dilution is that purely random errors in an explanatory factor will systematically weaken, that is, dilute its explanatory power. And this has been, they've both been recognized for a long time. These are not new facts, but I think they get underemphasized, particularly I think residual confounding gets underemphasized. Um, so because of noise, if you've got a noisily measured explanatory factor, then when you try and relate it to risk, the relationship will be shallower than it ought to be if you haven't got that noise. And then residual confounding, purely random errors. If you've got a confounding fact you want to adjust for, say, deprivation, then if because deprivation isn't a precisely measured thing, then there's effectively random error in what you're adjusting for and what goes into the computer. And this will weaken the effect of adjusting for it, leaving some residual confounding. It's easiest to discuss when what you're adjusting for is um, a simple real number with you know random errors attached to it as in the statistics class, but it applies whatever you're adjusting for. If you don't have perfect knowledge on it of it, then in general, when you try to adjust for it, you'll under adjust. Okay, so there's two different phenomena, weakening the explanatory power of something and weakening the effect of adjusting for confounder. And I want to talk about that, and I want to use a couple of examples of how strong these correlations might be. Now, in this whole area, the key the key idea is how strongly, how well related is your noisy knowledge of the explanatory variable of the confounder? How closely does that correlate with hypothetical perfect knowledge or perfect knowledge of all risk factors in the case of the confounder? If you just knew, had perfect knowledge with no random errors of all risk factors, how well would what you're adjusting for, the confounding thing you're adjusting for, correlate with that? And I, and I want to just to use would, as examples, which I'll come back to from time to time, correlations of of sixty percent and eighty percent. So I'll just show those two as examples. This is just showing what a sixty percent correlation looks like and what an eighty percent correlation looks like. Okay. So these are just random numbers drawn out of a computer, normally distributed. And on the left, we've got a 60% correlation between X and Y. And on the right, we've got an 80% correlation between X and Y. So even an 80% correlation certainly isn't perfect. These are normally distributed random variables with binomial normal, uh, uh, sorry, bivariate normal. And I just want to illustrate, I want to remind you of what a 60% correlation looks like and what an 80% correlation looks like. This is just a thousand random dots generated from the computer. Okay, so R is 0 0.6, the left-hand one, R is 0 0.8, the right-hand one, and in general, R is going to be how well our noisy information predicts the unknown truth. Okay, and I've just shown plots showing R, but in a way, the thing that's most directly related to the truth is R squared. So if R is 0 0.6 and R squared is going to be 0 0.36 and so on. So, okay, a noisily measured explanatory factor or a noisily measured confounding factor is not perfectly correlated with the true value of that factor, which is unknown, if perfect knowledge isn't available. Of course, for things like genetics, you can have perfect knowledge, but for most of the things in epidemiology that aren't genetics or sex or age, they're not reliably known. So if R is the correlation between the noise and the true value, then R squared determines directly how big the biases will be from regression dilution and from residual confounding. And just in case I don't get to the end of the talk, I, which sometimes happens in my talks, I've decided to put the summary at the beginning, and I'll come back to it at the end. So the summary, I'm going to use three examples where R, noisy versus true values, is 60% is correlated, that's the correlation of noisy versus true, it's 60%, 80%, or 100%. So that'll make R squared 0 0.36, 0 0.64, or 1.0. In other words, about a third, about two thirds, or one. So it's these things 
you're having only about a third the effect you should have, you're having two thirds the effect you should have, or you're having all the effect you should have if there wasn't any noise. So in the case of regression dilution with R squared, about one third, two thirds or one, the slope of a plot of risk versus your noisy explanatory factor will be only about a third as steep as it should be, or two thirds as steep as it should be, or exactly how steep it should be. By should be, I mean what it would have been if there hadn't been any noise. And then residual confounding with R squared about one third, two thirds or one. OK, so we've got an event rate ratio, perhaps comparing two groups, and we're going to adjust that for a confounding factor. Well, when we do so, then log RR will change. You know, we've, we've got a rate ratio, we can get log rate ratios, you know, as in logistic regression, as in Cox regression. Um, and so that log R will be changed by adjusting for this confounder. But because it, we've only got noisy information, we won't get the full change that we should get we'll get either a third of the change we should get in log RR, or we'll get two thirds of that change, or we'll get all that change if there isn't any noise. So change in log RR on adjusting for a noisy confound will be about one third, two thirds or all of what it should have been. Okay, I'll give an example of this, and it's a, it's a fairly well-known example. I'm just taking blood pressure. When you measure, if you take a blood pressure measurement, systolic blood pressure, and you try and relate just the stroke risk over the next 10 years, well, if the, your usual blood pressure, your typical blood pressure over the next decade is 130, then the measurement you make might turn out to be 120 or 140 or 130, you might get it right. But this, it's basically it's going to differ from your long term average by some random number. So by noise, in other words. And so if you relate stroke risk to noisy blood pressure, you'll get a weaker relationship than if you related stroke risk to usual blood pressure. And blood pressure is a nice simple number, and so you quantitate the extent to which that happens, and we can work out what R is. I mean, in that case, it'll be about 80%. You get about 0.8. So I'll give that as an example. So here's an example with R uh, 0.8, and this is blood pressure, and this is coronary heart disease mortality at ages 60 to 69 in the prospective studies collaboration, plotted against usual systolic blood pressure. Now, prospective studies collaboration had 61 studies with a million people in it, and so it had 34,000 heart attack deaths. So even if we were to stick to 60 to 69, we got a lot of data. A million adults, 61 prospective studies. And this is what you get at ages 60 to 69. This was published about 20 years ago. And I'm showing this graph. This graph has been corrected for regression dilution. If it hadn't, it would be only two thirds as steep. And it's also been done, there's other things that have been done right in trying to get this. So the problem very often in epidemiology is reverse causality. Well, that's been avoided. That was avoided in the prospective studies collaboration by excluding anybody who'd got disease at baseline and excluding the first couple of years of follow up. So you don't have people whose blood pressure has been adversely affected, has been reduced by disease. So when that's done, then you don't get any J-shaped curve. I mean, the 1980s epidemiology of blood pressure, everybody's talking about J-shaped curves where the relationship went down to about 140 or 130 and then turned and went up. But these low blood pressures, they didn't actually cause lower risk. They were the consequence of existing disease. So when you avoid reverse causality, you just do it right. Then you get a, you get a positive relationship throughout the normal range. And it's the only prospective studies we used. You can't do case control studies because having disease affects your, affects your blood pressure. Um, and the prospective study analyses have to admit everybody with prior disease. OK, that's one thing. And the other thing they got right was this question of regression dilution. And that made the slope about 50 percent steeper. And the way they allowed for regression dilution, this is Sarah Lewington's work, is that Baseline systolic blood pressure rankings were used. In other words, you work, you just use the baseline blood pressure measurement to sort people into low at baseline, middle at baseline, high at baseline, or whatever. In fact, there's about 10 groups because it's, this thing was so big. But you're just using the baseline blood pressure to categorize people with a group with a name, low at baseline, middle at baseline, high at baseline. But then to work out the mean, the mean blood pressure, the mean usual blood pressure in those groups, you need to come back a few years later and remeasure a sample of the low of the low at baseline, remeasure a sample of the middle at baseline, remeasure a sample of the high at baseline. And that the mean of those remeasurements, even though you're not remeasuring everybody, gives you 
the usual blood pressure in the lower at baseline, middle at baseline, high at baseline categories. You can also do it by mathematical modeling, assume you've got the same distribution of um, blood pressures at baseline and in the middle, but then that's a bit, you know, it's dependent on the model being right. And also it, it's, I think it's much more robust to use a partial resurvey, but even to fit a model, you need some sort of resurvey data to be able to fit the parameters of a model. But I think it's better to just take simple averaging at resurvey to try and allow for regression dilution. Okay, so summary, reverse causality was avoided, so no J-shaped curve was apparent, regression dilution was avoided, so the slope's 50% steeper, and so we get this, which is, which really carries very substantial implications for what are we going to do about blood pressure for when you use treatment, and you get the same relative risk, whether you're high risk or low risk, and you obviously want to, really, you want to use blood pressure risk drugs to treat high risk rather than treating high blood pressure as long as risk means risk of losing a good number of quality adjusted life years from something happening in the near future. Okay, here's the second one, cigarette smoking. This is Valerie Burrell's Million Women study. She asked a million women, you know, what they smoked and various other questions. Actually, she asked 1.3 million women, but she couldn't call it the 1.3 million women study. So she called it the Million Women study. And it's an example because you, it, the, the relationships are slightly different because there's a reliably known zero exposure. The never smokers at baseline would have stayed never smokers. Almost none of them would have started. And it's pretty reliable information. And so we've got that point is fixed. That isn't subject to drift or anything. But the ones who said they were smoking five or fewer cigarettes a day at baseline, when they were asked a few years later, well, actually, their average consumption was nearly 10 a day. And those who are smoking more than 20 or more cigarettes a day at baseline, well, when they were asked again later, their average was lower than it had been reported at baseline. And so she plotted the these groups, these three groups, low at baseline, middle at baseline, and high at baseline cigarette consumption against the mean cigarette consumption when she came back and got further information from a sample of them a few years later. So that's why... And that, of course, moves this light smoker point a bit to the right, and it moves the heavy smoker point a bit to the left. It doesn't change the risk, it just changes where you plotted along the x-axis. And so you get this fairly direct relationship instead of getting a really curious sort of elbow-shaped relationship, which has been published before and is wrong. So you've got to allow for regression dilution. Here, regression dilution isn't by the simple factor r squared, it's a bit complicated because the bottom point doesn't change. So again, the best way to correct for regression dilution is to use partial resurvey data to work out where you want these plots pointed point along the x-axis. The y-axis is easy. You just find out what group they're in a baseline, follow them up, observe the risk, standardized range, and things like that. And there you've got your risk. But where on the x-axis are you going to plot them? And for that, you need resurvey data. Okay, so. Now, all million women study analyses do routinely allow for reverse causality and regression dilution, and they adjust, and I've put that in inverted commas, for confounding factors such as education level and deprivation index, the Townsend deprivation index. Now, these are very imperfect measures of somebody's character or whatever it is. Yes, the people with little education, the people with high deprivation index, yeah, they smoke more, and so they get more disease. But what is it? I mean, how, how well are we characterizing these levels? Well, certainly not perfectly, probably quite a long way from perfectly. And so in the analyses that I've had the privilege of co-authoring with Barry and Kirsten of these data, we've published things that are just adjusted for the confounding factors, but without asking, well, OK, because adjustment made a difference, how much residual confounding might there have been? And that would have weakened the relationships slightly beyond what we've actually published. I'm not describing things that I'm not saying everybody else is wrong and I'm right. I'm saying I'm wrong as well. OK, so what are the possible effects of residual confounding in the million women study? I mean, could the deprivation of stuff get rid of the effects of smoking on heart disease, for example? You're never going to get rid of the effect of smoking on lung cancer. So it's so extreme. But what about the effect on heart disease? Is this a sort of effect of deprivation, low class, etc.? Um, well, the interpretation of deprivation adjusted analysis should consider residual confounding because it may still bias them and noise does affect deprivation indices so perfect adjustment for perfect deprivation indices would have produced bigger adjustments than adjustment for noisy ones 
And so Kirsten Pirries rerun some analyses for me, showing what happened when she did adjust for the noisy deprivation indices that we've got. And these are the things. So these are Cox relative risks for heart disease mortality by 2010 in the Million Women's Study. Current smoker versus never smoker at baseline, variously adjusted. OK, well, if you just adjust for age, age you can't adjust for sex because they're all women. But you can adjust for region as well. But anyway, the relative risks 5.1 when you adjust only for age. But it dropped to 4.3 after further adjustment for what was known of deprivation and lack of education. Now, that's an 11% reduction in the log relative risk. So if you take log 5.1 down to log 4.3, then you find the ratio of them is one is 11% lower than the other. OK, so might the reduction in log RR have been double or even triple this 11% reduction if it had been possible to adjust the perfect data on all relevant aspects of deprivation, any other confounders? Well, if it was triple, that would be a 33% reduction. A 33% reduction in log R would reduce RR equals 5.1 to RR equals 3.0. It's still an important excess risk, but it's less extreme than the RR of 4.3, which, which we published. So I think we didn't adjust enough, and I think it might have been double or triple. And the reason I say that is just it comes back to this question of residual confounding and of the factor R squared. You see, the, the if R squared was a third, in other words, if R is 0 0.6, then our adjustment, our adjustment for what we know would have done only one third of the adjusting that we would want to do. So in other words, instead of an 11% reduction, at the 11% reduction, if, if R squared was a third, would suggest that real reduction should have been 33%. See, it, the, these, these effects could be quite big, but to here we're talking about changing to 3.0 instead of 4.3. So if you do consider residual confounding, and if you say maybe the effects of adjustment of a perfect confounding, be three times the effect of adjusting for what we know of the confounding factors, still you've got a substantial effect of smoking on heart disease, a substantial association of smoking with heart disease. But I think we've got to the point where we've got to call it an effect on. <coughs> okay, I'll give a couple of other examples, then I'm going to drop into the into the algebra that I want to use. Two more examples. First, C-reactive protein and ischemic heart disease. C-reactive protein was discovered in about 1930, and there have been loads of papers, some from Harvard, some from Oxford, finding that plasma levels of, and from many other places, showing that plasma levels of C-reactive protein correlate with heart disease risk. C-reactive protein is raised by chronic inf inflammatory processes, and it's associated with ischemic heart disease. Um, and so is that association causal? Well, fortunately, there's some genetic determinants of C-reactive protein. They say, no, it isn't. The other example I'm going to give is fruit and lung cancer. So if you ask people, you know, how much fruit you eat, and you classify them as low fruit eaters or high fruit eaters at baseline, you find that low fruit eaters are smoking a lot more than high fruit eaters. Or conversely, if you ask about smoking, then ask about correct that with fruit, you'll find the smokers don't eat much fruit. So it seems as though, uh, superficially, that fruit is protecting against lung cancer. But among never smokers, there's no such effect. So maybe there's no such effect at all. And maybe what's left after we've adjusted for smoking is just residual confounding, no real effect. Okay, I'll just show one slide on each of these two things. One on C-reactive protein. Okay, <clears throat> these are C-reactive protein. This is risk ratio, you know, Ischemic heart disease risk onset rate ratio, well, incidence rate ratio or mortality rate ratio, depending on what study you're looking at. This is meta-analysis of studies. Um, when you just adjust for age, sex and ethnicity, you get a relative risk of 1.49. If you adjust for everything else you can think of, a whole string of things, then that relative risk drops down to 1.33, but it doesn't go any further. And they've, they've adjusted for all kinds of things. So it goes from 1.49 down to 1.33, but not any further. And yet, genetically, there are some SNPs that are quite common, you know, those with them common and those without are common. There are quite substantial determinants of CRP, plasma levels of CRP. 
and they don't they, these SNPs don't seem to be correlated with anything else, just with CRP. I mean, they must be correlated with something else, otherwise, you know, they don't work directly on CRP, so they're doing something. But anyway, so CRP itself is substantially affected by these SNPs. There's four SNPs, each of them has a substantial effect. And so they give you quite a nice null result. If you try to predict CRP from the SNPs, then absolutely you get no effect at all. So genetically determined CRP makes no material difference to heart disease risk. Therefore, this 1.33 was largely or wholly residual confounding, residual or unmeasured confounding. I mean, I use the term residual, but residual generally means residual or unmeasured. I mean, the distinction between them is it's, it's rather vague. I mean, there are some clear cases where it's something are totally unmeasured. But if you just measured something better and better, you know, there's so residual and unmeasured almost ought to be one word. Okay, so fruit and lung cancer, residual confounding after noisy adjustment for smoking exposure. And you might think, why is the adjustment for smoking noisy? We ask people what they smoke. Well, in the million women study, we see that even if they give you baseline information on what they smoke, that's not the long term average. There are differences. Um, also. Um, things like social class might have affected the age at which you started smoking, might have affected the intensity with which you smoked in early adult life. And the other thing it might very well do is be correlated with the probability that you're going to stop smoking during follow up. So there's various ways in which baseline information on smoking isn't a perfect measure of the extent to which disease rates over the next decade are going to be affected by smoke exposure. So when you adjust for smoking, or at least for what you know of smoking, the inverse association with fruit consumption just gets reduced. It still has a p-value of 10 to the minus 30, if you like p-values. So it just gets reduced by adjustment for realistically noisy measures of smoking, even though there's no effect in never smoke. There's no association of fruit intake with a, no inverse association, no positive or negative association of fruit intake with lung cancer in never smokers. The never smokers, you don't have any problem with residual confounding with smoking because they're so reliably down at negligible smoking exposure. So here's the data. Now this data comes from the Richard Doll Consortium, but I think it's one of the most uncontentious bits of it. So I'm showing it, it's unpublished still, but this obviously belongs to the 20 investigators who shared data with us. Um, and, oh, 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 go back. Okay, so down the bottom, we've got never smokers, fruit intake versus high fruit intake versus low fruit intake. Oh, damn, there's a typo there. That RR of 0.44 should be 0.96. Sorry, I was doing these slides at the last minute. So there's a, there's a glaring typo. Anyway, that RR is 0.96, totally non-significant, based on 3,000 lung cancers in never smokers, because there's millions of people in this collaboration. And then if we look in the whole population, then... If we adjust only for age and sex, you get the relative risk of 0.44, so showing that you know, fruit is associated with a halving of the risk of lung cancer. But then when we adjust for smoking and some other things, actually, the RR doesn't go to one. It goes only to 0.82. So it's jumping about three quarters of the way. The log RR is jumping about three quarters of the way, but not all the way. So it's still massively statistically significantly different from zero. And this must be largely or wholly residual confounding. Anyway, that would be even more obvious if that RR there said 0.96, which is what it should say. OK, now I'm going away from the real. I want to, I want to start with some real examples. Now I want to go to a hypothetical study to illustrate the algebra of this. And so this is totally artificial hypothetical set of data, but I think it makes the an algebra really clear. OK, so here we've got, so I'm going to have an imaginary prospective study with 400,000 people in it, 200,000 people aged 55, 200,000 aged 65, and they all came in either on their 55th birthday or on their 65th birthday, and they were all followed up for, well, the mean follow-up was the same for the 55-year-olds and the 65-year-olds, and we're going to relate risk to age and entry. So everybody is exact age 55 or exact age 65 in this. And I'm going to have heart disease or doubling every decade. So the 65 year olds have twice the risk of the 55 year olds. So those are, that's risk against real age. 
and it's going to be plotted on log scales. So the midpoint is 1.4 rather than 1.5. Um, so there's true risk against true age. And so if we plot a line through these on the right hand side here, we get exactly the right answer. We get the answer that risk doubles with every decade of age, every decade of true age. Now we're going to have an Excel gremlin come in. And the Excel gremlin is going to take every age in our Excel spreadsheet with 800,000 lines in it. It's going to take all 800,000 ages and it's going to add or subtract randomly five years from each age. So if your true age is 55, then by the time the gremlin's finished with the Excel spreadsheet, that age is going to be 50 or 60. The gremlin is adding noise. So we've got the exact age and we've got noise. Noise comes to the gremlin randomly adding plus or minus five. And if your true age is 65, then by the time the gremlins finish with you, your noisy age is going to be 60 or 70. And then we want to see what would happen if we plot risk against noisy age. So here on the left is there's the you see the white squares are the squares that you saw before, true age, except you don't know that anymore. All you know is the bright red squares, noisy age. So if you were 55, low risk then you'll have noisy age either 50 or 60. If your true age was 65, you'll have noisy age 60 or 70. And of course, for those whose noisy age is 60, they're half low risk, half high risk. And so their risk is going to be 1.5. But the low risk, those with noisy age 50 will have risk 1.0. Those with noisy age 70 will have risk 2.0. And those with noisy age 60 will have risk 1.5. And so now when we plot a line from through of risk versus noisy age, it's only about half as steep as it should be. So over on the right, you can see risk, same scale, against noisy age. We no longer know the true ages, all we know are the noisy ages. And it goes pretty well through 1.0 at noisy age 50 and 2.0 at noisy age 70. Actually, because we're using a log scale, that midpoint is a little bit above the line, but it doesn't make any difference. In fact, if you fitted this by Poisson regression, then it would be a straight line running from 1.04 to 2.04. So I say the slope is about half as steep as it should be. So now, instead of doubling every decade, we're doubling every 20 years. The slope is only half as steep as it should be. This is actually a case where R is 0 0.71, so R squared is 0 0.5. I mean, just it does is if you if you take those numbers I've given you with true ages and, and noise, then you'll find that the um, that the correlation between true age and noisy age is R equals 0 0.71, so R squared is 0 0.5. Um, so you're getting only half the slope you should. Now that's regression dilution, and it's a very similar thing when we talk about residual confounding. I'm going to take um, a couple of examples. One where there is a real effect, but it's confounded by age, and the second where there isn't a real effect. So I'm going to I'm going to take an example. I'm going to have pipe smokers versus never smokers, and I'm going to assume that pipe smoking doubles your risk. And, and I'm going to ha now have four groups. I'm going to have true age 35, 45, true age 55, 65. So we've got four age groups now, four age age categories. And I have the old ones smoking pipes, the young ones being non-smokers. There's total confounding chaos so what would be the effect of that okay first we'll start off looking at exactly so over here on the left is true age we haven't introduced any noise yet we've got no gremlins yet so and obviously the scale has to go further now now we've got an eightfold risk between the pipe smokers the pipe smokers not only are they 20 years older which gives them four times the risk but also pipe smoking doubles their risk and so this is the data on the left those two points to the right are among pipe smokers. Those two points down the bottom left are among non-smokers. And when we start fitting, if we jointly fit a model in which risk, actually log risk, depends on age and on whether or not you smoke, then we're essentially fitting two parallel lines, one among the pipe smokers, one among the non-smokers. And we're asking, what's the separation between those parallel lines? So you see, we're fitting a common factor factor of age to all of them. This is what you do in a COPS model or a regression model. 
you fit age, some multiple of age, plus you know some constant saying which which category you're on, you're in. And so if you did that, you'd get these two lines. The, the thick line up at the top right is the line rating risk to age among the pipe smokers, and the bottom one, the thin line with the thinner thinner line, the bottom left is risk versus age among the never smokers. And you can see that twofold difference between them. Now, what's going to happen now when we introduce noise? So I'm going to introduce the noise in exactly the same way that I did for aggression dilution, by exactly the same amount. So I'm going to take each true age, the gremlin is going to take each true age, it's going to add or subtract five from it, boom, boom, boom. So all the true ages will disappear in our Excel spreadsheet and all we'll be left with is noisy age. So here's the gremlin going to work, left-hand picture. So the top right and the left-hand picture is what you saw before, noisy age 50, 60, 70. And the bottom left is noisy age 30, 40, 50. And at the 50, 60, 70, then again, as before, here the pipe smokers have got risk four, mean risk four. If there's a, in the middle group with noisy age 60, then you're either 2.8 or 5.6. So you've got basically a risk of four, average risk of four. Um, and so when you plot risk against noisy age for the pipe smokers, you'll get just what we got for the regression, regression dilution, a line going from almost exactly from the risk at noisy age 50, pipe, pipe smokers with noisy age 50, to the risk in pipe smokers with noisy age 70, which you can see on the right-hand side. So that's that thick line at the, top, the upper line on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we'll see the same phenomenon, but just lower down. Again, it'll, the line will be almost exactly a line going from noisy age 30 up to noisy age 50. And again, there's that point just off the line that makes very little difference. So the difference between these two lines is no longer a difference of two. They now have a separation of four. You see, the pipe smokers started off with eight times the risk of the non-smokers because they were 20 years older, that gives them a fourfold and they have smoked pipes and other two. So they had eight times the risk of the never smokers. And the truth is they've just got two times the risk of the never smokers of a given age. But here, this, if we fitted noisy age, then we'll finish up with the pipe smokers having a relative risk of four instead of two. So their, their risk would have gone down, their relative risk would have gone down from eight to four. It should have gone down from eight to two. Instead, it went down from eight to four. On a log scale, it only, it only decreased half as much as it should do. Went from eight to four instead of eight to two. Because R squared was a half, R squared is a half in this case. So now I'm going to go to the last example, which instead of pipe smoking, I'm going to take something which I'll imagine is of no relevance at all, just wrinkly skin. And let's suppose now that everybody over 50 has got wrinkly skin and everybody under 50 has got smooth skin. What are these lines going to look like now? Well, if you look versus true age, it's easy. <clears throat> On the left, you see risk versus age for the wrinklies and the smoothies. So there's two lots of smoothies down the bottom left and two lots of wrinklies up at the top right. And you get a dead straight line um, with a nice 45 degree slope here, doubling every decade. And if you fit a line separately to the wrinklies, then you'll get that heavily dashed line up at the top right in the right hand picture. And if you fit the line separately to the smoothies, you'll get that thinner dashed line down the bottom, bottom left of the right hand picture. And you can see they're the same line. There's no separation between them. So you get the correct answer. Wrinkly skin doesn't matter. What matters is age. Wrinkliness doesn't matter at all. But if we take something that doesn't matter at all, like wrinkly skin, and, we and then the gremlin gets to work, then we get chaos. We'll finish up with a relative risk of two for wrinkly skin. So you see, we start off with wrinkly skin carrying a relative risk of four. You know, the wrinklies are 20 years older than the smoothies. But then the gremlin comes in and replaces age by noisy age. There. So here's the usual gremlin. We're used to this by now, I expect. And you can see among the wrinklies, the line is going to go from 1.4 at noisy age 50 to 2.8 at noisy age 70. Among the smoothies, it's going to go from 0.35 at noisy age 30 up to 0.7 at noisy age 50. There they are on the right. 
and you see they've got a separation of two. So instead of going from four down to one, we've gone from four down to two. We've only gone half as far as we should on a log scale. Okay, so I want to now just give the background to this a bit. I've been trying to think about this for about 50 years and it came into sharp focus when we were discussing the results from the Richard Dole Consortium. And the Richard Dole Consortium, it's a sort of meta-analysis. The aim is to try and bring together the evidence on dietary factors from the main studies, from 20 biggest studies. All 20 have agreed to collaborate. 19 or 20 have sent in their analyses. Harvard sent in their analyses, they're very good. So it's Valerie Browse, Million Women to Study, UK Biobank, and China Kadori Biobank. And there's only one that hasn't, and they've promised. So they'll probably do it sooner or later. So in 2021, the collaborators agreed to share pre specified analyses. They discussed what analyses were appropriate. Um, and of the questionnaire based, it's the questionnaire based epidemiological data on dietary factors. We're not looking at things like LDL cholesterol that you need to measure. Um, so these are questionnaire based things. Dietary factors with IHD and stroke as outcome and diabetes, actually. The aim is to go for careful collaborative review designed to avoid or limit biases. And the four biases that needed to be avoided were reverse causality. Well, OK, the studies are prospective. They're missing out those with disease. They miss out the first few years. No reverse, not little or no reverse causality. Publication bias, where we're getting all the biggest ones. So and we've got a pre-specified set of analyses for all of them. So no publication bias. Imprecision of the baseline dietary information. This is a major question because dietary questions don't give you precise information about long term differences. And so the long term differences aren't nearly as big as the baseline answers would suggest. That needs to be allowed for. That is weakening any relationships. But then unmeasured and residual confounding. Dietary factors correlate quite strongly with smoking. They correlate quite strongly with deprivation. These need to be allowed for, but when we allow for them, we're going to under adjust for them. And then the question is, by how much are we under adjusting? And I wish I could just come up at the end and say, and this is by how much we're under adjusting, but I can't. I just want to try and make it clear when thinking about it and discussing it. I'll go very briefly over these four biases and then close. Um, limiting effects, reverse causality, restrict attention to prospective studies. You can't do dietary studies retrospectively, you get bias. Omit people with prior disease of entry, okay. Omit the first three year, three or so years of follow-up. That's all been done in the analyses that have already been sent by the collaborators. Um, limit the effects of publication bias, okay. We specify which of the studies, the biggest ones, those with more than 100,000 by 2010. We specify a set of exposures, particular dietary factors. It's the ones, questionnaire-based ones that were listed as important by the global burden of disease and risk factors. Specify a set of outcomes, disease rates. Those were chosen by the collaborators as partly in the light of what the global burden of disease said, but chiefly it's vascular ones. And then for each exposure outcome pair thus specified, seek detailed analyses of it from all eligible studies with relevant data and from no other studies. Okay, that avoids publication bias. That's all been done. Um, Limiting the effects of imprecise baseline data, you know, progression dilution. OK, so for each dietary factor, check how the extreme baseline categ categories of intake, lowest versus highest, were defined in each study. What words did they use? Check whether those baseline defined categories were at least moderately predictive of what you're going to see a few years later. A later partial research, you don't have to resurvey the whole population. That's all been done and it, where possible. But only half the studies actually did have resurveys. And really, if you're doing prospective studies, you have to have resurveys. Otherwise, you don't know what your baseline data mean. The interpretation will involve judgments, which may differ, but not enormously. I mean, everybody agrees that this dilution is an important problem. It's just easy and that you can get some data on it from relating the baseline survey to resurvey. Then the difficult one is the residual confounding. Dietary factors correlate with other vascular risk factors. They correlate with each other too. Smoking, education, other deprivation, body mass index, adiposity. Body mass index isn't a perfect index of adiposity, actually. It's good enough in populations where adiposity is the main variation. Adiposity is the main determinant of variation in BMI. But in some populations, that's not true. Um, so, and then BMI is not a good surrogate for adiposity. And then adjustment of a relative risk, say high versus low intake of something or other, for realistically noisy measures of these confounders merely reduces these problems because substantial residual confounding will remain after it, as was illustrated by smoking and lung cancer or 
The relevant analyses have all been done and sent to the RDC, and they've been being put together. Their interpretation will involve judgments not only may differ, do differ. And the key thing is to get the data transparently available. But how to interpret them remains, how to interpret residual confounding remains the most difficult issue to address properly. So I'll come back to my two summary slides and then stop. OK, R and R squared. As I said, noisily measured expansionary factor isn't perfectly correlated with the true value of that factor. If R is the correlation between the noise and the true value, and R squared determines directly how big the biases will be when things are simple numbers from regression dilution or from residual confounding. Now, there's a little detail here. That, that correlation has a nice simple meaning when I'm talking about relig, um, regression dilution. But you remember, sorry, when I'm talking about um, regression dilution, but in residual confounding, if you remember, what we were doing was fitting two lines, one within the wrinklies, one within the smoothies. And so what matters for regression for residual confounding is what's the correlation between truth between noisy and true factor within the wrinklies and within the smoothies. And that's called a partial correlation coefficient. But OK, so for when you're comparing two exposure groups, an R is actually the partial correlation coefficient within those two groups between a noisy confounder score based on the knowledge available and a true risk score based on hypothetical perfect knowledge of all measured or unmeasured risk factors. OK, it's, and how much, how much can plausibly be ascribed to residual or unmeasured confounding isn't going to be something that gets agreed, nor is it something that should be agreed. It's actually difficult. OK, so again, I think the, th the numbers to bear in mind, I think, are the three examples I gave. And I'm not going to show the examples again. I just want to remind you of these numbers. If R, noisy versus true, is 60%, 80% or 100%, that makes R squared about a third, about two thirds, or about or one perfect knowledge. And regression dilution with R squared about a third, two thirds, or one would mean that the slope is about a third, two thirds, or all of what it would have been without noise. Residual confounding with R squared about one third, two thirds, or one, if an event rate ratio will be adjusted for a confounder, then the change in log RR. You know, for that event rate ratio, say low versus high fruit intake, on adjusting for a noisy confounder will be about one third, two thirds or all of what it would have been without noise. So if the change is one third or two thirds or all of what it would have been, then what that means is if you've only made a third the change you should make, then there's two thirds of the change still to make. If you've made if you've made two thirds of the change you should make, there's only one third of the change still to make. If you've made all the changes you should make because you've got a perfect measure of the confounding factor, then You've done it. There isn't any residual confounding. And again, the reminder, there's those correlations. 0.8 isn't a brilliant correlation. How how good is the correlation? What, what does it mean to talk about the correlation between perfect knowledge of everything to do with deprivation and what we know is a deprivation score? I don't know. There's my answer. Blank.